I've been reading that uh, 20th verse. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of souls. Maybe I should read the 19th verse also. There was a certain rich man, was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of souls, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would come would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from him. <laughs> and he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, and he may testify unto them, as they also come into this place of torment. I would like to talk to you tonight for a little while about the message the rich man wanted his brethren to hear. Normally, under any normal circumstance, a man who is suffering or in need, or who has a serious problem in his life, would normally enjoy, and not only enjoy, but reach out for the association of his friends or his relatives, especially. You know yourself, when you're sick in body, maybe real sick, it's a comfort to have your relatives close by you. And uh, it's just normal, that's natural. In fact, uh, generally you would send for them, send for your children to come in. With the, of the child, you would send for your parents. It's comforting to have your brethren come in to see you and be with you during the time of your sickness or your trial. It's a natural instinct. But I would like for you to know this story tonight. There is something the rich man wanted his brethren to hear. And whatever this something was, completely neutralized the natural impulse for him to want his brethren with him. Now we have evidence in this scripture that he loved his brethren. But the love that he had for them, which would normally want him to have them close by, is now the other. Something has changed. There's something about what he knows that he wants them to know, and the reason he wants them to know is simply that they would not come to where he is. Say, Brother Bean, there must be something wrong with a man that wouldn't want his brother. No, no, not in this. I feel an obligation tonight, and if you will, please hear this preacher, as I give you the best that I know how. 
a message the rich man wanted his brother. The first place, there's some things about hell that none of us know about. There's no way for us to know. But we do have the word of the Lord, and then I, my personal experience, I was praying one night, and I said, God, I don't feel that I have sufficient knowledge about hell to have the burden for lost soul or to be able to preach it as I ought. I wish while I was laying here on this bed in this dark, I'm here talking to you, I wish you'd show me something about hell. And God answered my request that night, began to unfold before my eyes one of the most horrible pictures that I ever wanted. In fact, it was so horrible until I begged God to take it out of my mind. I just couldn't retain it. I don't believe you could retain your sanity and just keep thinking on what begun to unfold before my eyes. Friends, believe me tonight, there is a real hell. Real hell. Now, if this rich man was here in this earth, I am certain that he could preach more effectively in five minutes than I will the whole time when I'm up here. But I can't, uh, can't get him here. There's no way that I can bring him to you tonight. So I have to do the best I know from the word of the Lord and from what God has shown me and revealed to me in the Spirit. I'll have to do the best I can. Now, he wanted his brethren to hear this. But uh, I would imagine tonight, if I could talk to that rich man, that he would not stop at that. I am certain that if I would ask him the question, rich man, would you want this message to be carried even beyond your brethren? Would you want? What about the folks in law of Mississippi tonight? I would be certain that he would scream from wherever he's at now and say, whatever you do, preach it. Preach that. In fact, I'd almost be willing to assure you that uh, if men in hell had their wishes, there would not be a service go by that hell was not described in that service. I'm just sure of that. I know my name. There are some things about going to hell that I don't know. The scripture doesn't make clear. First of all, there is one point that is clear enough. In fact, every place I see it mentioned about folks being cast to hell or taken to hell. In every case, it mentions and specifies that they were thrown or cast. Cast the man to outer darkness, sir. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. In every case, it is the fact that they were thrown, cast, thrown. In other words, some immortal being with immortal strength takes each individual, and in some instances, it records that they were bound hand and foot. Find them. It says, on certain occasions, find them. And then this immortal being, evidently assigned that job, takes them in his hand, and with immortal strength, in every case, there's no riding of an automobile, there's no plane ride, there's no train ride, there's no trolley car that you put on, you're not ushered into a sheriff's car and taken off. In every case, they were thrown, thrown, just thrown, cast, no certain way to fall, just thrown, cast, cast them and drown them, cast them, cast them, cast them. That alone brings to me a horrible thought. To just suddenly be thrust and thrown into outer space. And 
In every case, I read, generally the first thing that is mentioned is cast them into outer darkness. That's the first thing they experience is darkness. First thing. Now, how long a man falls, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But God's time means so very little. Today is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So it means nothing to God. Time means nothing. Really nothing. And from the time that that individual leaves the throne room, and here goes with words from the mouth of the judge, Depart from me. From the time he has taken his immoral hands and thrown without a gun. From that time till he reaches hell, I do not know. You could actually uh, fall a thousand many years. I don't know. Time means so little to God. It could be that God planned it that you will fall for one thousand years and just fall. That could be a part of the punishment. And in fact, that would be a horrible part. The fact that you were just lost. I've talked to paratroopers, and they tell me that is one of the most horrible feelings, just to be false in mid act. Time those fellows, and they get to the door of that plane, they, they have to kick them out, shove them out. And just freeze. They can't, they, they, the thoughts are just falling. And uh, the suspense of it. The anxiety involved in it. When do I reach hell? How long do I fall? The speed that you fall is very possible. That you will go like uh, under the tongue of the night. I understand that if those uh, astronauts would re-enter space just as a human being, their body would actually burn up, would glow and burn. And, uh, I can see uh, this individual is thrown. How fast, I don't know. But through outer space, it's in through darkness. You'll be falling, and the suspense of it is how long, and when do I reach hell? And you think in your mind, if, if I could just go ahead and reach there and get this over, this anticipation and anxiety and the uncertainty of it and the fall. Well, that, uh, that is yet to be seen. I couldn't tell you about it. All I know is that there will be a falling. There will be a throwing of men, casting them through some uh, space without a darkness. Some folks have got to figure out that hell is in the heart of the earth. And I'll not argue with you about that. But I'd rather think maybe that God has some place for it because they're cast, they're thrown, and first into outer darkness. First into outer darkness. The space is somewhere they will uh, fall. Here they are head first a while. And I guess seeing so many people, it's possible, bumping against one another. Feet first a while, sideways, face down a while, backwards a while, just fall. And of course, that'll be very tiring. Strenuous. Very strenuous. Tiring. Just to be fall. And, uh, well, when you reach hell, there are some things I'd like to tell you that you will expect to happen. I know possibly will happen to you. We have people that would be Pentecostal if it wasn't for the fact that they want to have their short hair and their makeup and they want to look like the world. And they don't want to be a pale face. They want to be pretty. And uh, they claim that that's, that's uh, more beauty involved in that than there is in this. I do not agree with it. Even from the natural standpoint, if I wasn't a Pentecostal, I would look at a Pentecostal woman and say that she is far more beautiful than someone in the world. That's just my opinion, and I have a right to that opinion. And I'm not prejudiced there. But, of course, uh, uh, well, I don't want to be a Pentecostal on this account. Well, I would like to inform you, young lady, the first thing that happens to you the minute that you splash into hell. Like the comet from the sky, you splash into your eternal home. The first thing that happens to you, the hair of your head will be singed off. These things that you were so careful to pluck and to arch and take care of and paint and fix up will be singed away. The uh, fingers on your hands will be burned off. There will be nothing but stubs or hands. 
the smaller members of your body will burn away. And everybody in hell looks just exactly alike. You could not tell a male from a female. Souls are burned off. Smaller members of the body are burned away. And everybody there is nothing but a charred mummy. No hair on anyone's head. And uh, no fingernails to paint. No lips to really paint because they're burned, charred, and raw flesh is uh, sticking out everywhere. And so immediately the thing that you found it so valuable to you in one instant will be gone for eternity. It will never return to you. They do not have a dressing room in hell. They uh, wouldn't need a comb. There's no hair on anybody's head. It seems to burn away. And uh, everybody looks alike. Just a mass of charred mummy. All charred, burned, charred. And so the beauty fades instantly and immediately the minute you reach hell. And then starts the long, long, long endless and suffering. And there's some things that the Bible declares very plainly about that place. And oh, I wish I could talk to all the laws tonight. I don't know what I'd give if I could have all of this city here and plead with them just for a little while. Friend, what I'm telling you is the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. It is real. It's genuine. And if I could call the rich man tonight, he would say, Preacher, preach them the message that I have. Tell them. Tell my brother. Tell my friend. Tell them. He said, Let they come to this place. I don't even want my kindred here. The punishment is so severe. I do not want my kindred to be with me. And you know it must be severe. You know it must be severe. And there are some things that are definitely true about hell that the Bible declares without question. The, the continual thought, and the thing about it, you think, well, if I never reach hell, finally I get there and I put my feet on something. And uh, I could find something to lean against. Well, the thing about it is, my Bible said it's a bottomless pit. Bottomless. That means simply that you never cease to fall. Just fall. fall. Can you imagine how hard that would be? Just, just, uh, that you were put into a drive, just tumbling, tumbling, head first to fire, feet first to fire, fire. Just forever and forever fall. Because it's bottomless. You never do get to the bottom of it. If you never find the place that you could say, this is bottomless, this is it here. Because it's not there. You just don't find it in here. And the Bible declares this. This is plain. This is clear and without question. The Bible says they rest not day nor night. That means they'll be tired in hell. I travel so much, 
never forget coming from Florida one night. One day, I traveled 900 miles that day. Just steady, constant driving, just stopping long enough to gas up and get a little bit of ease and keep driving. A free man can really be tossed 900 miles in one day. And uh, many times have I driven way in the night, just on and on and on. Tired. In fact, you just drive so much to even when you go to bed, you feel like you're still driving. You can't seem to go to sleep. Too tired. Still driving. But I'll never forget, I came to a friend's house in Louis Gannon that night. It was really a, uh, a good feeling to know that, that I was welcome in that home. They had a good bed for me, and if I wanted something to eat, they had something good to eat. But in hell, the thing is, you never reach a friend's house. There are no motel or hotels in hell. No uh, inviting sign of such and such a motel. They don't even as much as have a sidewalk to sit on. They don't even as much have a chair or a basket or anything, just anything, a drum, anything to sit on in hell. And you're, the process of falling has wearied you, the anxiety and the nervous tension of it. And then, here's another thing. Hell will be a place, the Bible declares this, as brimstone. Fire and brimstone will be belching out of it. Brimstone is burning so, the most suffocating smoke there is. And here you are, trying to get a little oxygen in your lungs. And that alone can be tiresome. Have you ever smothered in your life? That can be a tiresome thing to struggle for a break. I want to pray for a man that had the very serious case of Adam, and he was on the floor, lying on the floor, just, 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 just lying, grabbing things, struggling, pulling, just to get a breath, or oh, just to look at him, I just, I just, it hurt me, I just smothered my head to look at him. Well, in hell, you will constantly be pulling for just, just, have you ever been in a tight place and, and you can't uh, get the brain? If I could just get one, I could just, I could just get one breath. But you don't ever, ever in hell get any oxygen in your lungs. They just don't have it. It's nothing but the mass of burning sulfur. You're breathing it. And you're struggling. And that alone would make you tired. And you'll be so tired until you hurt. And I have been that tired. I've been so tired that if you feel like you wanted to cry. And God knows that I'm not that much of a physicist. But I've been so tired it seems like if I can just cry to the hell. But in hell, in hell, just sick time, just sick, sick time. But the Bible says they rest not. They, oh, no. they don't ever, ever sit down. Don't ever sit down. And just, just, no, no, not in hell. It's a continual movement. It's a continual perpetual movement. All oh. And bumping and struggling and pulling for breath constantly in hell. In hell. Yes, sir. Beauty's gone. Ambitions and hopes are gone. And now then you're in hell. And the thing I, that, that makes it so bad, according to this Bible right here that I hold in my hand, according to this Bible and its averages, and it's specific. I am talking to people now that will go to hell. Right now, Brother Lawrence, as sure as this Bible is God's Word, I am talking to people that will experience what I'm telling about now, plus the things I don't know about. Just as sure as there's a God in heaven. The sad part of it, according to this Bible, and it averages and statistics. I am talking to people who now have the Holy Ghost. 
that will later wind up in hell. Five were wise and five were foolish. The enclosure of hell, the loneliness of it. Though there will be multiplied millions of people there, you will be alone. No one's interested in you, everyone's interested in himself. Hell will be a mass of demon power. There are death, demon power, that make people sick. There are actually afflictions that are direct results of demon forces. I believe there is a demon called cancer. I believe there is a demon of tuberculosis. I believe there are demon spirits that would cause the human body to suffer. Now the thing that I've studied about hell is this. For the thousand years millennium period, my Bible said Satan is bound, but he is loose. And not one place do you find where he was ever bound again. If I understand my Bible, they will be cast a loose in the hell. That means the flu demon will be in hell. That means the cancer demon will be loose in hell. Which simply means his power to make you sick and to bring affliction will still be there. In hell plus the torture of the flame, you will be one mass of cancer, one mass of horrible diseases and the feeling of flu and fever and sick and nauseous. Oh, how nauseous, how sick. And the pain that wrecks the different parts of your body as a result of loose demons in hell. Who says that their power is taken away from them in hell? It just simply means they're there for torment. But in their torment, who knows but what the steam of their power will still be there? Amen. Oh, friend, in hell. And I don't know if you've ever heard demons possess people or not make noises. I have. And I'm sure that some of you have. But if you haven't, that's the most horrible sound in the world. Uh, I heard a little girl with a theme of the best, and every breath, she was uh, just rocking back and forth. And every breath was a groan that I would not uh, know how to, to uh, make the same thing. I just don't leave it to me. It was a blood curdling groan, constantly. <laughs> every breath. No, they get so tired under the influence of demons. Take a breath. You see, the devil does things by us. He does things by rhythm. Everything he does is rhythm. That's why the rock and roll goes over. I talked to a young man who prayed through in a revival where I was at, and uh, he was uh, had won a national award as a teenage dancer. And he told me, he said, Brother Beanie, he told me the different dances. I asked him, I said, what do y'all do here? Do the twist or what is it? He said, that's amateurish anymore, the twist. I said, don't tell me there's anything worse than that. He said, we've got the mashed potatoes, and we've got the shout, and we've got the monkey, and we've got all of this other stuff. And he said, I'd be playing the piano at times and get so in the spirit of that until I would scream and get up and tear my clothes off of me. The power, the rhythm of it, the powers of hell, it works in rhythm. 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 That's why in Jamaica they've got the demon worshippers down there. They're gathered around you on the sidewalk. And this is not near the right. They look like Pentecost. They are talking a jabbering tongue and all of that, but they're worshippers of the devil. And they'll gather around you and start a loud beating of the drum, and everybody get in the rhythm. And the first thing you know, you'll fall out and you'll lay there for days under the spell of the power. It's the rhythm of it, the rhythm of it, the rhythm of it. In hell, it will be a mass of rhythm. Satan and his forces will start 
And I can hear it now. And you're so tired and you're struggling for breath, you don't want to say anything. I'm too tired to talk. I'm too tired to scream. But the powers that are there won't let you stop in the rhythm of it. And I see it start now as those demons look and scream. I'm lost! And they start that rhythm. I'm lost! I'm lost! I'm lost! And you start joining with them. You don't want to say it, but you can't help it. The rhythm of it and the spirit and the powers that are there have got you on this way. Hypnotized by the powers of Satan and his forces. And the concussion of ten million times ten million voices. Can you imagine millions and millions of millions of voices as loud as they can all at the same time? Don't you know that they're concussion from those voices that hit you up like waves of the sea and dash you against one another? And lost in the waves of the sea. And there you go. And after a while, it's screaming again. It picks you up. The body, the concussion of hell itself. And here you are. Time. You get the time? Oh, if I could just leave you. But not in here. The story of this man wanted to get back. Let that come. Don't let him come. Now I suffer myself without the friendship and the fellowship of my brethren. Rather than see them come. Tell us, please tell us, please tell us. And so. I'm telling you the story tonight. The rich man knows it. If he could come here in five minutes, he could, he possibly could persuade you. Another thing about it. I thought of it. thought of it. And hell. First of all, let's go back to the judgment for a moment. I have reasons to believe that at the judgment, there will be a time of goodbye. I really believe that. Several reasons I believe it. First of all, I find in the Bible where it said that God will wipe the tears from his faint eye. Now, somewhere, it looks to me like the glorified saints will we. Somewhere God's going to have to wipe tears from somebody's eyes and they're his children. Now, I wouldn't argue with you over it, but I personally believe to add to the torture of your lost and doomed condition, God is going to grant a time of goodbye just as a man in a courtroom has been sentenced to the electric chair. But before they handcuff him or before they leave him out of that courtroom, he gets a chance to kiss his wife and mother and dad and children all the time. And they all say bye. And then they lead him on to death row. I personally believe that God is going to grant that at the judgment. I believe that with my whole heart. I'll tell you one reason. Another impressive point is a heaven in uh, Houston, Texas. There's a woman tonight in Miller Kilgore's church, one of the finest saints I've ever seen in my life. Even before this program, Brother Wilhart got up, Brother Kilgore tells me the woman never failed to bring in someone to new, new to preach every Sunday night. Not one time has she failed to bring somebody brand new in that church. She was a sinner. Knew nothing about God or the Holy Ghost. Most invited to church would make her mad. She was not interested in God. She was not Pentecostal. She had not been raised around it at all. One day, her little girl, by the name of Debbie, drowned. I forget Debbie's age now. She was just, just a little child. She could uh, talk some, but she was just a small child. And uh, a Catholic woman came by and visited with her later and 
But why don't you go and get the priest to pray your child out of purgatory? Well, she didn't believe that, but it got her to thinking, is my child saved or lost? I never took her to church. I wasn't interested in God. My baby is dead, and I wonder if it's saved or lost. And it left her run the woman crazy. She prayed night and day, night and day. God, could you show me about my child? One night she was praying about two o'clock. She had not thrown to sleep. She was wide awake, crying and praying. In the way that she knew how to pray. And all of a sudden, little Debbie appeared at the foot of her bed. And she said, Debbie, is that you? And she said, yes, Mommy, it is. She said, well, if it is, come over here and let me love you. Debbie came over to the bedside. And her mother reached out and took her in her arms. And she said, I have never felt anything like her flesh. It was not like human flesh. It was uh, more like velvet, yet it wasn't like velvet that I could not explain. Said she had no clothes on, yet she was not naked. She was cold with light. And she said, Mommy, Jesus heard your prayer and sent me to tell you that I'm all right. Now, remember, the child knew nothing about the Holy Ghost nor her mother. But the little girl says to her mother, says, Mommy, Jesus sent me to tell you that you're going to have to receive the Holy Ghost or you cannot come where I'm at. And not only that, Mommy, she said, uh, Jesus told me to tell you to tell everybody you see that they're going to have to get the Holy Ghost so they cannot come where I'm at. She said, Debbie, are you happy? She said, Oh, Mommy. And all this time, she's trying to pull away, and she's anxious to go. And finally, she said, Mommy, I love you, but I've got to go. And she said, Bye, Mommy, and she started out. Her mother ran outside and watched her, and she stopped over the building and waved goodbye. She said, Bye, Mommy, I love you, but I've got to go. Bye, Mommy, I love you, but I've got to go. I personally believe that when the judge has read the verdict over you, I believe with all of my heart that it will be a time allotted for the saying of goodbye. Please. First of all, I believe that uh, I have told some of you this before. My father died. The last words I remember him saying to me was, I'm lost, and it's nobody's fault but mine. I personally believe that the judgment, it will be somewhat on this order. I believe there will be witnesses. No, you're not the saints, so just the earth. And I believe that Alexander Franklin Bean will be called to the saints. And I believe the judge will say, is there anyone here that would witness against him? And by the law of justice, I must stand up and tell the truth. Judge, I am his son. What have you got to say for it? I'll have to say, Judge, I'll have to say it. I'm sorry to say it. But I'll have to say that those nights that uh, he would go to church and carry me as a little boy. And I would lean over on his shoulder, standing on the old church pew. And I would lean over against his shoulder, and I would wet his shoulder with tears, and say, Daddy, won't you please go pray? And I'd have to say, Judge, that every time he turned me down, and he said no. And Judge, I would also have to say that when I would go home at night, I would wet my pillow with tears the way in the morning, just a little boy, crying because my dad would not come. And Judge, I also remember that I dreamed that he and another man, the name of Smith, was walking towards the church house. And we were all taken into rapture just before the two of them got to the church. Not long after that, Mr. Smith died lost. Not much longer after that, my dad died. And I have to say, Judge, that I told him that dream. Not only that, but uh, I also have brother, a brother and two sisters. And at times, they would dream in the night that he was lost. 
And those sisters were waking up, dad, scared, trembling, crying, dad, I dreamed he was lost. The judge, I'd have to say that he sent them back to bed, told them everything would be all right. Now, as far as I know, as far as I witness, Judge, I'll have to say the last word he told me on this earth, I remember. His own word, he confessed, I'm lost. It's nobody's fault. All right. Witness, and there another. My mother would have to stand and witness that she preached the last sermon that he ever got in his life as an individual. So the bill section she preached that night and conviction fell on him. And he was standing by another man, and this is his own testimony. He said conviction would hit this other man, and then it would hit him. Then it would hit this man. Hit him. But it looked like one of us was going to have to go. The other man went. And Dad walked outside and expressed himself to some of the men. He said, well, boys, I may have got it tonight. I don't know. And Judge, my old mother stands to witness. Why, for this man, stands to witness that she preached the last Sunday, and he ever got a chance to hear the new faith. Now the verdict. Sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me into everlasting chains of darkness. Prepare for the devil and his angels. All right, there's the time of silence. Now see, just before the immortal being takes him by the hand, he turns and looks at his family. I believe this with my whole heart. I believe that I'll actually tell him goodbye. I believe that I'll wave at him. Goodbye, Daddy. I love you. I love you now, but you can't be my daddy anymore. Goodbye. Sorry, Daddy. He's got to stay here on this beautiful shore. His wife waves goodbye. Alec, I've prayed for you many times. Four o'clock in the morning, his mother has awakened me crying out to God. Say, sorry, Alec, but can't be your wife anymore. We love you. Goodbye. The thought that comes to my mind is this. And you hear me tonight, friend. God is talking to someone in the service. If you love your children, my advice to you is take them in your arms tonight and love them all you know how. Hold them close because in hell there'll be no babies to hold. I don't understand it. I cannot figure it out to save my life. Why a man or woman, for the sake of their children, would not want to live for God. The most unfair thing you can do for your children is to leave them the testimony that you were lost. I'd rather know that my dad was saved than for him to have left an inheritance of a million dollars. I don't mind the fact that we had to pay some of the debt he owed. He was a hard-working man, but cutting laws in this kind of weather, he just didn't get to work. And that's all right. We paid his debt. But if I could just know, if I could have just had a word somewhere of some sort, of hope and encouragement that he would save. But pray not so. Goodbye. 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 Can you imagine the mass? Goodbye. Goodbye. Mommy, I love you, but goodbye. The little old hand waves. I'm going to stay here on this beautiful shore. You've got to go. And I have to goodbye. Can you imagine the mass? Goodbye. Goodbye. Mommy, I love you, but goodbye. The little old hand waves. I'm going to stay here on this beautiful shore. You've got to go. And I have a scriptural proof that in hell, people who are in hell will be able to see folks who are in heaven. My Bible said the rich man saw Lazarus afar off, recognized him as Lazarus in Abraham's book. In hell, you will be able to see those that you love. My dad, through the smoke of that torment, will be able to see his boy, his wife, his daughter. And they are. And they are. Can you imagine? Mother, come on, face the fact. The most cruel thing you can do tonight in your family is the little son of God. There's nothing that is more cruel in this world than your family. 
the most unmerciful act that you can carry out, the most criminal thing that you can do, is to leave those very silly to be this world lost. And someday you have to part from them and hear their little goodbye. Sorry, Mom. I love you. I tell you the truth. To me, if there was no flame in hell, if they had beautiful sofa and air conditioned room to just be taken away from my baby would be hell of And me to be able to look younger and see my little girl around the beautiful white throne, see my wife, my mother, never they are. And I will never again hear their death. I will never again feel the touch of their feet. Never will my little girl reach her arms up to daddy to take care of it. Because they don't think. No gay laughter of a child in hell, no patter of little feet that would ever have caused any of the uh, parts of hell. They okay, just don't have them. Okay. And the horrible part is, you're looking soft and in hell. And the uh, youngest said, uh, maybe a saved love one. If you know, pray for you so many times. There's Brother Long. You see, Brother Long. Brother Long. And though you know there's no use for you to scream, but you'll scream and fight. You'll do it as sure as there is a hell. You're going to scream in hell and call the names of those that you can see. Maybe it's a saved mother. Maybe it's a saved dad. Maybe it's a saved child. Maybe it's a brother or sister. Maybe it's Mother Lord, and he'll scream. Mother Lord, Mother Lord, Mother, 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 Daddy, Daddy. Oh, children, look here. Here's your dad, Lord. Here's your mother, Lord. Here's your brother and sister, whatever it is. Can't you hear me? Can't you pray for me just one more time? Can't you call on God just one more time? I know you can. I know you want to be saved. Can't you see me in this predicament and you're free 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 and and you walk on in now and forget them all. That's going to be the blessed thing about him. That when he finally wipes the tears, you'll remember them no more. If I remembered my daddy in heaven, heaven wouldn't be him. Wouldn't be him. But somewhere in the process of it, he's going to take a memory away. And I'll never look towards the lost again. Never will I gaze from the city to see if I could see him in that awful day. He will see me constantly marching around that throne, dressed in that beautiful white linen. Glory, honor, praise to the name of God, enjoying the bliss of that great eternal city. <clears throat> but this, the old palace, no, he won't have any fingers left. Burn away. He will reach. Son, pray for me one more time. Leaning your head on my shoulder, begging me to go to the one more time. Son, I'm sorry I turned you down. I'm sorry. Son, I'm sorry that I caused you to cry away in the past. Oh, son, could you pray for me just one more time? Why could you preach one more time? I was preaching a while in the place. Then I was fast. And it was hot weather and I started to take a drink of water at the church. The parsley. Started to take a drink of water. And I just got it to my lips and I saw it. And just to be honest with you, it took me a long time before I could drink. I thought about an old man somewhere. I had to be drinking. First thing, that's Every, every human sense will be at its peak. 
Hungry in hell, oh, hungry. The dope addict will want his dope more than ever. The sucker will want his dope. The smoker will want his dope. Craving, craving, in hell. I thought of it. If God would just say now, brother, time doesn't mean anything to me, but I'm going to a lot, a lot time. I'm going to make time possible in eternity. And once every many years, at a certain time, when that red hand of the clock reaches a certain spot, if you are present and in the right place, I'll grant you the privilege of opening that door and taking your daddy's glass of water. Or just a drop. Just a drop. That's all the rich man has all the drop. He said, I might just get a drop. I'll be very honest with you. You could shout around the throne all you wanted to. But this boy would start 10,000 years ahead of time watching the clock. I want to be sure y'all go ahead and shout that I'm going to sit right here at the spot where he's full minute away. 10,000 years I would wait. I would not go anywhere. I would not move. I would wait for my time. He would say, all right, brother, it'll burn your hands to take hold of the door. That's way he said, all right. But if you open the door and you're there at that certain time, once every million years, I'll let you dip your finger in water and touch your dad's tongue. I promise you I'd be there on time. I'd be And I'd swing the door wide and I would swing his hand. I would never be late. I would wait patiently for my time. Oh, friend, there's a real thing. There's a real It waits for you, man. It's open mouth, gapping wide, the Bible said it's enlarged. I'm afraid that even we apostolics do not believe in the reality of hell. If we did, you would not have to beg for you to go in personal work if we really believe there was a hell. My God, there is a hell tonight. Mother, take your darling girl in your arms and hold her close because just a matter of time and you'll have to tell her goodbye. Bye. Bye, Mommy. I still love you, but I've got to go. Dear Lamb of God, tonight, I beg you as sincerely as I've ever begged in my life. Something will happen in this service. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Oh my God. 